Welcome to season two of The Great Humbling. My name's Dougal Hine. I'm a writer and co-founder of a school called Home. Through the strange spring of 2020, I kept a weekly appointment with the futurist Ed Gillespie, where we would puzzle our way through the stories taking shape around the pandemic and how all this fits into a longer arc of social, political and ecological crisis. We called these conversations The Great Humbling because we started from a sense that this is a time of being humbled, brought down to earth, and we wanted to ask what happens if we approach the moment we're in on those terms. Now we're back for a second season, where each week we'll be taking a state of mind that seems to be part of the mix of being alive just now. So this is The Great Humbling Season 2, Altered States. States of being, states of consciousness, and of course, the literal alteration of our nation states. Thanks for listening. Okay, welcome to episode two. And we're going to take a slightly different tack today. Wander a little bit away from the focus on the pandemic that seemed so in the foreground of everything when we were recording these things in the spring and take us towards a rather different state, the state of grace. Are you feeling that today, Ed? Well, I've, I've just returned from a long weekend with my daughter on the Norfolk and Suffolk border, staying with grandma, uh, digging gravel on Dunwich Beach, walking the Waveney Valley marshes and, and sleeping in a forest. So I'm feeling full of bucolic autumnal bliss. And I also watched The Social Dilemma last night, so uh, I feel my latent concerns around tech madness have been sharpened somewhat. And I'll say a bit more about those things later, but yes, I am feeling a bit of a state of grace this morning. Well, that's good to hear. I thought since we're we're taking a different tack, we might structure this conversation a little differently and dive straight into the subject matter. I wanted to start maybe unexpectedly with a piece by... Adam Ramsey that appeared on Open Democracy a few weeks ago, a piece called Queer Eye, Jordan Peterson and the Battle for Depressed Men. And I mean, I thought it was a really strong article. I have to admit, I have not watched Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. Have you, Ed? (laughs) You surprised me, Dougal. Um, Yes. No, my former partner was a huge fan, uh, particularly of Jonathan Van Ness, one of the co-presenting team, who's another gentleman of prodigious creative output and and actually uh, raw personal honesty. And his podcast, Getting Curious with Jonathan Van Ness, is definitely worth a listen. Uh, he's done almost 200 episodes now and covers everything from universal basic income to non-binary gender politics. But I mean, I agree with Adam Ramsey. Queer Eye is, is quite quietly subversive politically and culturally and it and it seems to me to begin to practice what we might call a sort of radical friendliness or wild generosity gently removing the masks we wear whilst masquerading as a simple makeover show i was thinking about this and i was thinking that has always been just to prove that i do watch television sometimes there has always been this kind of undercurrent within reality tv where you know it's mostly most reality tv is a cruel business but then there's this sort of thin strand of programs that are transformative rather than exploitative and the one that came to mind for me was faking it do you remember that yes i do they used to take someone who you might think of as belonging to one stereotype and give them coaching of different kinds from experts and drama coaches. And then after a month, they had to pass themselves off as something that stereotypically might seem like the opposite of the person you met at the beginning of the programme. I knew a guy who went on that in the first series at university. He produced a production of Godspell that I was in. (laughs) And you were what in Godspell? I I was crucified on a nightly (laughs) basis with a matinee on Saturday. Well, that's something we both have in common then. I think I recall being crucified in a passion play while I was working as a volunteer teacher in Jamaica many moons ago. So, Well, there you go. This is how we found our way to this state of grace in which you meet us today. But I remember this guy went on faking it and had to fake it as a nightclub bouncer. And at the beginning of the programme, he came out to his parents. 
And he was one of these people who like, his life was transformed in a good way by going on that program. So, you know, I guess maybe Queer Eye, at least in what I understand is its current incarnation, has something in common with that. But anyway, this, this piece that I wanted to talk about, it's sort of born out of two sets of experience. On the one hand, Adam Ramsey's journalistic work to understand the new networks of far-right parties in Europe and beyond, including going undercover at these rallies in Italy and Spain where he was posing as a potential donor. And it's also drawing on his personal experience with depression, which he writes about very honestly. And where these two things come together is in his analysis of the influence of Jordan Peterson and the ideas with which he's associated in the milieu of these new far-right parties. And he says, you know, the appeal of these movements and of the self-help culture that Peterson has become part of is that this is a world which gives meaning to struggling men. And this is where Queer Eye comes in, because Ramsey's arguing that it offers something that can compete against the toughen up masculine individualism you get from Peterson. And what it's offering is emotional solidarity. He's saying the reboot of Queer Eye actually reflects a shift in American liberalism from the era when the original series came out, when liberals still believed in the American dream and the, the great promise of meritocracy that, you know, you can make yourself into a winner, to now this generation of liberals who can see through that and who see, as Ramsey puts it, that fulfilment doesn't come from reaching up, but from reaching out to those around you. And even so, Ramsey's arguing it's, it's also caught on the limits of liberalism. The series is still leaning into the idea that the way to improve your life for the better is through entrepreneurship. And it leans away from looking at class, at the larger economic realities that our lives are caught in, and at what community organising or workplace organising might look like in the world that it's meeting and addressing. And, you know, there's so much that I agree with in Ramsey's argument, including, including his honesty as someone who writes from the left about the ways that the left can often fail to address the emotional and psychological damage done by living under the social and economic conditions that we have after decades of neoliberalism. There was a bit in there that really struck home personally to me from my experience in my mid-twenties, the way that activism can end up being a sort of substitute for emotional and psychological health. It can be a thing that you channel yourself into to get some of the things that you're not getting from being able to have healthy relationships with people around you. It's a way to feel strongly without having to let people close. That was how I began to see it after those experiences that I had when I was you know, a bit younger than I am now. But there's this one bit in the whole article that jars with me, and I almost didn't notice it the first time I read because it's kind of in passing. But it's when Ramsey is writing about this cosmic battle between Peterson on the one side and Queer Eye or at least the version of Queer Eye that he'd like to see, where they add a union organiser to the team on the other side. He sets this up in terms of choosing between Carl Jung and archetypal psychology on the one side and Antonio Gramsci and the analysis of hegemony on the other side. And I want to say, why do we have to choose? Why make this into an either-or binary I'm not going to pretend that I've read more than a handful of pages of Jung or Gramsci, but I have read and I've hung out with and been influenced by people who have drawn a lot from one or both of them and done it without being uncritical disciples. And I just have a sense that there's a gap here. That's what I really want to talk about today. And, you know, to give an example, I'm thinking of Martin Shaw, someone who we keep coming back to in this podcast because he's been important to both of us, I think, as a friend and a teacher. And, you know, Martin, one of the strands that he draws on, besides all of the storytelling craft and the wilderness rites of passage work and the people he's learned that from, is the men's movement, as they call it. In you know, It was particularly strong in the 80s and 90s around Robert Bly. 
Now, we might be far from uncritical of what Jung or Bly or others did with myth and dream in the 20th century, but it strikes me that if we just slap this warning sign on the side of anything that has to do with archetypes or myth or whatever and say, this way fascism lies, I, I don't think that's the answer that people on the left sometimes talk as if it is. I mean, Ed, you've been part of the school of myth. Is that... Do you want to just tell us a bit about your experiences with that? Yeah, well, I can certainly try. Um, there's no doubt the West Country School of Myth is infused with the vapours of Devon. Um, and Martin would be the first to talk about his own special relationship with the land that claimed him, his beloved Dartmoor. But I don't think it's about a particular place or people necessarily. My experience was actually that it's the precise opposite of anything parochial or, or patriotic. And in actual fact, it, it was very visceral, transcendental and universal even. And our group certainly weren't a rabid bunch of Albion Easters. It was quite a global group, you know, including people from all over the world, from Iran to Scandinavia. But uh, my sense is that Martin talks through the stories he shares to touch on the really deep recognitions that we all have for human dilemmas, experiences and patterns of behaviour. Um, and that that obviously uses uh, a lot of the archetypal type of work. And there's always a tingle of resonance that I've found that occurs with certain images in a story or the feeling that you know and recognise the precise set of circumstances being encountered by a character. And one that's very live for me right now, and perhaps for, for all of us in a wider sense, is, is a scene from Ivan and the Grey Wolf, which is a Russian tale, where Ivan is off on his quest to find the firebird and he's riding his horse through a forest and he comes to a fork in the road where there's a stone that says, take the left fork and you will live, but your horse will die and take the right fork and you will die, but your horse will live. Uh, and it's quite a powerful metaphor in which the horse represents our culture uh, and Ivan, the individual, and speaks potently to our time of, of letting go, of questioning what we might be attempting to sustain or, or prolong or, or, of actually living beyond the machines. So I tell you something funny, which is as you're talking about that image from Martin. Now, the, the thing that actually took me back to Adam Ramsey's piece was a post from somebody who I've known for a long time as what, for want of a better word, I think of as the collapse bloggers, a guy called John Michael Greer. And literally the same day that I read Adam Ramsey's piece, I saw the latest of Greer's weekly essays on his blog, Ecosophia, and it was about Jung. Now, I, this needs some kind of health warning, maybe, because Greer is a self-described moderate Burkean conservative. If you read between the lines of his pieces and the discussions that he hosts on his blog, although the discussions involve a very a wide mixture of views in a pretty civil context that's not that common online these days, you definitely get a sense that he is Trump friendly to some degree. You could easily paint him as exactly the kind of figure who proves why we need to steer clear of Jung and archetypes and all of this. But Greer is also somebody I've read most weeks for 15 years, and I published him alongside all sorts of people with very different political backgrounds or no particular political background in the pages of Dark Mountain. And actually, I think there's something that seems to get forgotten a lot these days, which is you don't have to agree with someone about everything to learn from them. And you don't get contaminated by learning from somebody who you might disagree with about some important things. So anyway, in this, this latest post, Greer gives the best summary I've read of Jung's theory of synchronicity, including about the origins of the theory of archetypes in the study of animal behaviour, and then Jung's observation working with his patients that in dealing with these deep patterns, you seem to trigger strings of meaningful coincidences. And that's what he calls synchronicities. As Greer says, this is the bit that brought Jung into conflict with the foundations of modern thought, these two assumptions that go back to the 17th century that are tangled up with the history of science but are in no sense established on the basis of doing science, their beliefs. Firstly, there's the dogma of materialism, which insists that everything that exists in the universe is ultimately nothing more than matter in motion. And secondly, the dogma of mechanism, 
which insists that everything that happens in the universe is the result of precise and, at least in theory, predictable chains of cause and effect. So those are the the definitions that Greer gives summing this up. And what he says is, inside of this framework of materialism and mechanism, it's impossible to admit that there might be too many coincidences in our experience for it to be a coincidence. Now, there's lots of stuff I could say about that, but the point I want to make here is I don't want to have to choose between taking this kind of thinking seriously and taking the things that we can learn from Gramsci and other thinkers of the left seriously. And I guess I'm labouring this point precisely because of how much there is in the Adam Ramsey article that resonates really strongly with me. And it feels like there are conversations we need to join up in ways that the binary positions don't allow for. And I think that description of synchronicity really chimes with me. It's what W.B. Yeats described as a sense that the world is full of magic things, patiently waiting for our senses to grow sharper. And that strange coincidences or correlations or correlations are, are not without meaning. We just have to be attuned to them. When I read John Michael Greer's piece, it made me think of three examples of possible synchronicity I've experienced in just the last week alone. First, I returned to London with my daughter from visiting family in Norfolk to find my 20-year-old boiler had retired itself from duties. Uh, And as I bathed my daughter that night using water I'd boiled on the cooker, I was mentally adding find boiler engineer, replace boiler rather wearily to my long mental to-do list. And the following morning, there was a knock on my front door and it was a boiler engineer. And he'd come to the wrong block by mistake. And so, you know, I actually laughed out loud. And I, I told him what had happened, took his card, and two days later, he had fitted me a shiny new boiler. And that's relatively prosaic. And But then while staying with my mum in Norfolk last weekend, on the first night, I had a not unpleasant dream about Scarlett Johansson. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, it was fairly vivid. And I joked with my mum at breakfast about it. I dreamt about Scarlett Johansson too, she exclaimed. More weirdly... My mum hadn't even known who Scarlett Johansson was until a week or so previously when she'd read an article about her. Neither of us had mentioned her during our very, very brief conversation when I'd arrived late from London the previous evening. Yet somehow she had featured prominently in both our dreams, though I suspect our dreams were were different. Um, A Freudian analysis might be more appropriate. (laughs) And finally, there's a legendary old pub on the marshes near where I grew up which I walked to on Saturday with an old friend and our daughters. And as we have sat in the sun-dappled beer garden, cattle lowing in the late afternoon sun, he told me the freehold was suddenly up for auction in a few weeks' time. And so we were discussing how a crowd fund for a community buyout to turn the venue into the greenest, fairest pub in the country, as well as a sort of prominent climate barometer because it sits barely a metre above sea level in its river valley. And we were getting excited about how this might be possible. But we'd need a bridging loan, you know, to act at speed in order to to buy it at auction. And I half joked that uh, a local lad made good, uh, a, a seriously famous artist and musician, who I won't name here, but who had a house just down the road and who I knew through some climate activism work. And I thought he might be up for providing such a loan. And then on my walk home... My daughter and I bumped into uh, aforesaid famous musician out for an evening stroll with his partner. Now, (laughs) those three things, I mean, serendipity, um, synchronicity, but as I say, they're just three examples from the last week. And one precious thing I genuinely do feel I've learned from working with Martin Shaw and, and at the School of Myth is for my senses to grow that little bit sharper and to be alert uh, not in the hypervigilant sense that we were discussing last week, but rather much more open to the cues and clues around me. I remember when we shut the Dark Mountain Festival after four years of running it, and I wrote a piece looking back on it. There was this really weird, extraordinary downpour that lasted for about three minutes that landed just at the moment where Paul and I were getting up to give our kind of farewell speeches at the end of the very final festival. And it felt like the world joining in with what we were all saying to each other as this community of people who got to know each other through those gatherings. And I remember writing about this and I remember saying, it's best not to hold on too tightly to those kind of experiences, Mm. but to treat them like a joke that the world joined in with. That's a lovely way of putting it. I mean, you just, you just remind me of another one, actually, when I did the Mundus Maginalis course with Martin at Schumacher. And on the first night, sat around the fire, he passed around a basket of poems. And we all had to pick a poem 
he joked, the poem will pick you. We learned the poems by heart um, over the next three days and we all shared them around the fire on the last day. And there was a guy, an American guy called Sandy, who had a particular poem in which there was a line, if you get run over by the locomotive of the Lord. But when he read this poem, as he read that line, we heard the whistle precisely of the the steam train that runs down the dark valley. Oh, yeah. That you know, came through the trees, which we'd not heard over the previous few days, but it literally chimed with that line. And then at the end of the poem, this guy, Sandy, said, he goes, I used to work on the railways in New York, and uh, and I had to retire early because I got run over by a train. What are the odds? So, okay, on the same day that John Michael Greer's post about synchronicity landed... I also got the latest of this series of essays that Hugh Lemmy is publishing on Substack. He's got this newsletter with the self-deprecating title, Utopian Drivel. (laughs) Now, Hugh is someone I knew years ago in London, a queer left activist. He's hardcore in the best way. And I love the rawness of his writing, his willingness to leave things messy and show the broken and the unfinished. And this particular essay... It's a really beautiful piece. It's called Santa Maria de la Sumpción. It's written in the aftermath of the lockdown in Barcelona, where he lives, and about this trip that he makes to this valley north of the city with, as he describes it, a set of churches that seem as though they have survived the end of the world again and again. They don't even get into the the churches because the doors are locked, but he says at a point, I, what I needed wasn't inside them. But there's... um. A bit in the middle of the essay that speaks straight to the thing that I'm struggling with here, which is the relationship between the bit of me that reads Ramsey channeling Gramsci and nods along to that, and the bit of me that reads Greer channeling Jung and nods along to that. And here it is. I'm just going to read this chunk from from Hugh's essay. I feel guilty for having fallen for escapism and for wanting to escape at exactly the moment when it has become indefensible, but I feel compelled to move towards it. And as I think about it, I realise it's not because I want to escape the real world, to ignore the concretely political. I just want to escape thinking of it only directly, face on. It might be because after years of obsessing about the political aesthetic, the slogans and banners, the labels and discourse, I felt like it and I actually obscured something more politically meaningful in life. Perhaps what is meaningful in escapism is the world that is implicitly missing, escaped from. Or perhaps I want to discover in my novel attraction to escape everything I feel I missed about my interactions with the world when I was consumed with the slogans, the banners and anger. That that might be something good, valuable, with something to teach me. That penultimate line, everything I feel I missed about my interactions with the world when I was consumed with the slogans, the banners and anger. I mean, that hits me straight in the solar plexus. It actually takes my breath away. Um, It's a brilliant articulation of what I think I felt after 20 years of consultancy and crafting strategies and coining strap lines and taglines and concocting oh so clever ways of spinning yet another moderately mediocre and mealy-mouthed corporate endeavour into something vaguely interesting and palatable. When the real feast, you know, was clearly elsewhere. And it's, it's all too easy to be convinced of your own self-righteous success, I think, whilst actually being utterly assimilated. Uh, and we've touched on that assimilation into the machine, but, um, the idea of not wanting to face things always directly or head on is important, I think. Um, and it b- brings to mind the Philip K. Dick quote from his 1981 novel, uh, Valis, Vast Active Living Intelligence System, where he says, the empire is the institution. It's the codification of derangement. It is insane and imposes its insanity on us by violence, since its nature is a violent one. To fight the empire is to be infected by its derangement. And this is a paradox. Whoever defeats a segment of the empire becomes the empire. It proliferates like a virus, imposing its form on its enemies, and therefore it becomes its enemies. And and derangement, we could just as easily use disenchantment something we touched on last week in regard to martin shaw's wolfland that john michael greer references in his piece in regard to the industrial revolutions disenchantment of the world uh, and perhaps perhaps there's no way to resist a deranged and disenchanted system on its own terms it's only through grounded humility and re-enchantment that hope can be rekindled 
I have this strong memory from when I was in my mid 20s and I went and spent six months teaching English in China or in Xinjiang, which is the far west of China, which is a really kind of messed up corner of the world. I was mostly teaching teenagers and kids, but I had this one adult student who was doing a course in literature in her spare time. And she was a lawyer and she had this anthology of excerpts from the classics of the English literary canon. And each week we would get together for an hour and I was trying to help her find her way into how do you read English poetry and make sense of what you're reading? Because if she didn't understand a word, she'd look through the dictionary and find more and more rare definitions of the word to try and find one that would match. And I was trying to go, well, you have to connect things up. You have to look for what's the pattern of the image that's going on here. So one week she had the to be or not to be speech from Hamlet. So I'm saying to her, you know, to sleep, perchance to dream. So, OK, if we say that sleep is death, what might dreaming be? I say, well, you know, what might happen after you die? And she looks at me <laughs> and she says, I am a member of the Chinese Communist Party and nothing will happen to me after I die. <laughs> and a few weeks later, we had the metaphysical poet. She came in and she said, metaphysics is wrong. <laughs> Because that was kind of, that was her interpretation of the, the party doctrine that she had, had been taught. And, you know, it's kind of a comic version of something that I think is, has often been true on the left. And actually, particularly on the most kind of intellectually rigorous end of the left, which is this kind of gap of having nothing to say about metaphysics, nothing to say about anything that lies outside of that box of the material and the mechanism. And you, know, you can just deny that there is anything there. You can just say metaphysics is wrong. Or you can allow in other ways of knowing and relating to the world into that gap alongside the parts of reality and ways of knowing that your politics give you tools for talking about and acting on. And I realise as I say this, how often the people who have influenced me most embody that second option, the bringing of political commitments into dialogue with the metaphysical and doing it without simply confusing the two. I'm thinking of John Berger here as uh, maybe the, the most extraordinary exponent of that, but there are others. And I mean, the stuff here that we'll come back to in future episodes, I suspect. But I did have one more piece that I wanted to talk to you about this week. And this, I, in case I haven't flashed enough warning signs on um, people's <laughs> radars already, this comes from Gordon White, who's a Tasmanian chaos magic blogger and podcaster. He has a site called Rune Soup and a podcast of the same name. He is an anarchist and an animist. Nothing wrong with that. He's also well into his conspiracy theories, including in relation to the pandemic. And I'm not saying you should trust Gordon, I'm not saying you should trust John Michael Greer or anybody I quote, actually. But I think we need to be able to think with and learn from people we don't entirely trust or agree with. And this piece that I'm thinking of is called How You Play Is What You Win. It's an epic blog post that deploys in all seriousness everything from astrology to demography to Mark Fisher's Exiting the Vampire Castle, which actually brings us all the way around to the Adam Ramsey piece I started with, because Mark Fisher is really one of the great recent writers on the left who has taken seriously depression and the psychological and the emotional impacts of living under neoliberalism. But anyway, the bit that I wanted to pick out from Gordon's post is where he quotes Carol Sanford, who's talking about this satirical book called Flatland, that was published in 1884 by an English schoolmaster with the name of Edwin A. Abbott. The A actually stood for Abbott, so his name was Edwin Abbott Abbott. <laughs> Imagine if he became, he went into a monastery and he became an abbot. He'd be Abbott Edwin Abbott Abbott. So they so good they named him thrice. <laughs> it's about, so this book, Flatland, it's about the residents of a two-dimensional world who, when they look at a sphere, they can only see a circle. And then they go from this two-dimensional world 
to a one-dimensional world where it's even worse because people there, whatever the look, they look at, they only see it as a point. <laughs> and what Carol Sanford and Gordon White are arguing is that this is a lot like the ways in which we often get stuck in our discourse, in our attempts to think and do politics and to make sense of the world, that you know, we get stuck in two dimensions or in one dimension and that developing the ability to shift up to think with more dimensions is the thing that unlocks possibilities that are hidden from view as long as we think that the dimensions that we've been thinking with are all the things that we have available. And I guess for me, the reason why this fits with what we're doing with this podcast is because that shifting up involves becoming humbler. Because uh, once you move up, once you bring in more dimensions, it gets harder to set the whole thing up, as Sanford says, as a heroic battle in which all of the right belongs on your side and all of the wrong is on the other side. That strikes me as actually something one of my, and I met many amazing people at the School of Myth, but one of my compatriots, uh, uh, an Australian guy called Leon Cossa, he wrote on Facebook recently, he said, where a culture is dearth of a mythic relationship and kinship with a place that gives meaning and ground to stand upon in troubled times they've already lost the battle they don't know what they're fighting for anymore they will make it personal and fight each other because everything has become about the individual they will think it's about material things or free speech but they weren't happy when they had all the things and if they had free speech they wouldn't know what to say or who they were ostensibly speaking on behalf of and when they speak their words float you can't hear the silence behind them or see the ground in which they grew. There's no dirt on them. You know, I listen to that and I get it. And it speaks directly to me. And I wonder whether people listening to us, whether it makes sense or whether, whether this is a point where we lose people in these conversations, maybe. <laughs> or whether there are ways of hearing and taking and turning around some of the lines or phrases or words in a passage like that to make it mean something which I do not think is what your friend Leon is actually mm. getting at. And I think we have to take the risk of our words being misheard because we need to find ways of having these conversations. And there is something here about I think it's sometimes talked about as secular religiosity, the way that the energy of belief returns in less acknowledged forms when we leave it out. So if we try to do everything in the dimension of the political without allowing any room for there being a dimension of metaphysics, then what happens isn't that we become these kind of rational, modern characters. It's more that you get a sort of return of the spirit of religion without any self-awareness of it playing out through the language of, of politics. Like Leon says, they will think it's about material things or free speech, but something else is speaking through us that we've not got a handle on. Exactly. Martin Shaw also had a post recently called Kicking the Robbers Out of the House, where he brought our attention to the fact that we make things holy by the kind of attention we give to them which obviously begs the question what are we giving our attentions to and if it's solely in that one-dimensional political um perhaps we're left wanting and certainly at the school of myth residentials every morning before breakfast we held a little dream weaving session where people could share their nocturnal subconscious adventures and we would explore them together to compare the imagery and the themes including the ones involving scarlett johansson uh, I didn't have that one at the School of Myth, mercifully. That would have made... Well, it's interesting because it was my job to illustrate these uh, woven dreams. So that would have been an interesting drawing. Um, it was always uncanny to find the connections and links unfolding and the shared symbolism that was coming up. And perhaps unsurprising in the sort of hothouse mythical atmosphere of the school. But I've also heard from others who work with dreams of, of strange recurrent images amongst their groups, like the motif of the puffer fish which seemed to pop up independently in several places pre-pandemic, which is a sort of odd, imaginal mental image of the coronavirus to come. And certainly there's a, a lot of work being done around corona dreams themselves. Now, obviously, as we've referred to the sort of Susie Orbach assault on the collective 
uh, unconscious as a result of the pandemic. It's not surprising then that we have more frequent, more intense, perhaps more disturbing dreams through the collective psychology. Or equally, the work I've done at the Forward Institute, where we've done a couple of dream sessions with responsible leaders, um, quite high-flying folk, some of whom have not had a dream they can recall in over a decade, which again speaks to this sort of disconnection from something. Which brought me or brings me right round to, you know, the idea of a state of grace, not in that religious sense, which is to live beyond or without sin. But, you know, Jonathan Porrett, one of my mentors, once observed that we all sup with the devil. Some of us just use a really long spoon. So I don't think we're talking about this state of grace in terms of sin per se. But I do think, you know, we're all connected into our own senses of responsibility. And when we get into that polarised positioning that Carol Sanford was talking about, these heroic battles, I, I, I think it flushes out another interesting question. is like, where is the, the grist or the space, and maybe this is where the state of grace lies, between the battle mode, you know, of the somewhat derogatorily labelled social justice warriors and the flip side or the extreme of that, which is seem to be just acquiescence, you know, or navel gazing of some description. And I, you know, I think that's what my former business partner once said to you, Dougald, uh, get down off your dark mountain and get back to work. I think what she actually said was get down off your dark mountain, you're making things worse. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I would have mentioned this if you hadn't. The complexity of holding what we're reaching for here Years ago, I wrote this blog post that was called Everything I Learned, 2003 to 2010. And after about 5,000 words, at the end of it, I summed it up into one line. And it was something like this. Resist the temptation to allow a situation to be defined in terms of the oppositions present within it. Resist the temptation to allow a situation to be defined in terms of the oppositions present within it. And it's like a tightrope where you can fall off on one side by defining the situation in terms of those oppositions, by not allowing there to be any more to it than that. Mm. And you can fall off on the other side by denying that those oppositions are present and important. And, you know, if I was listening to this in the US at the moment, I could imagine that I might well feel uncomfortable with these two guys having this kind of chat about how problematic it is that everything is polarised because I might feel, whichever side I was listening to this from, you know, actually this polarity is for real and who wins this election matters a lot. And that, you know, that's where my response to that get down off the mountain thing would come from is a sense of timing and timeliness. You know, if there's one thing I learned over 10 years of being at least partially responsible for holding that space of Dark Mountain, it was that on the one hand, we need the space of the mountain, the space of retreat in both the military and the spiritual sense of the word. You know, people find their way to Dark Mountain at the point where the stuff they've been doing has stopped making sense. And they needed a place where they could come to that was not subject to the pressure to say the right thing the pressure to move quickly to answers or to action or to feel shame about not feeling what you think you're meant to feel. And we held this space within which all of that was possible and people would come to those festivals and they'd have a sense of coming alive. And then by the Sunday morning, someone would start a session that would go, right, what are we going to do? And my role was to step in as politely as possible into the kind of conversations that began in those sessions and say, there is no we here that can do something. The thing that we have experienced together is precisely because this is not the space of doing or planning or strategizing or acting. And that's not to disparage those kinds of spaces. It's just to recognize that we need more than one kind of space in our lives. And that sense of coming alive that you get when you go up the mountain has to do with it being a different kind of space. Equally, Almost no one can spend their whole lives in that space of the mountain. You know, maybe there are some monks and hermits for whom that's right. But for most of us, we have to make the journey back down into the everyday and try and see which bits of what made sense to us up on the mountain still make sense to us 
when we get back to the front line or the backyard or the office or the community space, wherever it is that we pick up the work that's ours to do. So again, it's not that the binary isn't there. It's that each end of it is holding a different part of the truth if we can bring enough dimensions into our way of looking at it. You know, that that reflects in the you know, the onerous responsibility that people take on when, you know, it's all about saving the planet. I mean, I wrote about this in increasingly exasperated terms earlier this year because that's the ultimate responsibility and I'll probably ultimately doom to failure. But, you know, I'm an, I think I wrote the planet does not want to be saved or rescued or even changed, which are all of those actions of doing. Our, our planet actually probably wants to be loved. And there is something metaphysical and a and state of grace like about reconnecting with nature in this sense of wholehearted appreciation. I, I talked about it in series one, I know, when I talked about some of the amazing moments with the Corvids and the Jays and the magpies and the crows around my Brixton flat during lockdown. But I've also had an in, intense encounter with a Robin at, at Schumacher uh, College immediately after a Martin session, where we'd really been at the trembling edge of consciousness, probably in a in a dark mountain type of sense. And another exchange of whistled song with a group of birds in a in a West Island forest when I was working with Paul Kingsnorth and Andreas Cordeville last August. And actually that connects into what Anushka Gross, uh, who wrote her guide to eco-anxiety, calls the charisma of birds. I do think there are these symbolic and metaphysical moments that do occur away from the the thinking and the doing spaces. Perhaps my most powerful is doing a, a 24-hour wilderness vigil up in the Pyrenees with my, my friend Andrews Roberts of Way of Nature. And during my particular 24-hour solo, I was right on the edge of a cliff. I was sat there sort of naked doing my nature communing and suddenly this enormous white albino mountain goat with massive curved horns came came trotting right up to me oh, and yeah. we had this intense standoff uh for about sort of 45 seconds a minute or so it felt like hours and my initial thought was oh my god he's going to gore me uh and my naked gored body is going to be found and everyone's going to wonder what the hell i was doing with a goat on a mountain um <laughs> but but it was but it was incredible and obviously something, you know, powerfully symbolic about that. And that was actually in 2015, which is in, in many senses a year my life began to change quite dramatically, um, with a subsequent trip to Antarctica and the death of my father. So I guess in some ways we should try and bring some of this roving conversation to, uh, a conclusion. As I said at the beginning, I watched the social dilemma, uh, last night, the film about social media and it, the sort of madness of, uh, us individually having to battle the, the cumulative and collective intelligence of massive AI fueled algorithms and the sort of hopelessness of that oppositional battle, if you like, the forces that are arrayed against us, we are completely vulnerable, um, in the face of. And it struck me uh, as a book my friend Casper to Kyle wrote, The Power of Ritual, where he talks about tech Sabbath. Um, and if you follow Casper on social media, you'll know on a Friday evening, he always posts a message which essentially says the work is not done, but it is time to stop. And then he, you know, he does his 24 hour tech Sabbath. But I think that is partly a step towards a state of grace. The second thing I wanted to finish on was thinking about breath work. And we touched on this before when we talked about conspiracy and the original meaning of the word of breathing together but it struck me actually i was talking to my brother about this um and he's been practicing some of the vim hof breathing techniques and he said actually it's about the space between the breaths when you do the wim hof technique and you do your 30 sharp inhalations you can have a minute or two where you are neither inhaling inspiring or exhaling but you can literally sit in that peace between the breaths and i thought that was a, a beautiful notion um for a state of grace neither inspiring nor exhaling but pausing in that space between the breaths and then finally a quote from marianne williamson who wrote a piece in Newsweek, she said, she's a psychologist, she said, America is having a nervous breakdown, a spiritual crisis, a complete disassembling of the personality after which a more authentic self might emerge. America's down on its knees this time. But that's not the bad news, it's the good news. 
that's ultimately not where things end, but where things begin again. It's where we can find grace and humility and forgiveness and love. Until then, we will continue to suffer, just like as a nation we've allowed so much suffering to go unnoticed among us and around us. The pain at this moment is the pain of a nation that is labouring towards its own rebirth. We are a good and decent people, but we have failed to take responsibility for some things that have consistently been done in our name. In horror, we must come to realise this, and in contrition, we will be released. And that, I felt, is perhaps where a state of grace could be found. Thank you for listening to The Great Humbling. We see this podcast as very much an exploration, not a prescription. A provisional investigation that maybe loves questions more than answers to begin with and needs a little time and space to breathe. If you are new to the podcast, please do revisit Season 1, as we are aiming to build on ideas, insights and narratives already touched upon. And together, this will hopefully enable us all to make a little more sense of these strange times we are living through. Please do comment, ask questions and respond via our Facebook page, The Great Humbling, or via my Twitter account, at Frucal. And we would obviously deeply appreciate and be grateful for any ratings, reviews, recommendations or sharing you might feel compelled to contribute as a result of listening. Our title music is I Recall by Blue Dot Sessions, used gratefully under a Creative Commons licence. We're living in a time of humbling, an initiation at a cultural scale. Please join us on this emergent journey.